scripture reading just a moment ago in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, uh, Brother Alex read for us that passage in which there is a warning that is given. It is given in the form of a question, and we take that question and we use that as the title of our lesson today, How Shall We Escape? If we neglect so great salvation. You know, we have stories all the time of various ones who have escaped from dangerous perils. For example, in our Old Testament, we can read about Jonah, who escaped from the mouth of a whale. We can read about Daniel, who escaped the lion's den. We read about the Apostle Paul and his company that escaped a shipwreck. And of course, all of that by the grace of God. We sometimes hear stories about people who escape from prison or they escape from jail. We sometimes read stories after a major earthquake somewhere in which someone escapes or has been found underneath the rubble. And, and we think about what a wonderful thing that is. And so there are many results that come from a great escape. But there are those who seem to reason in their minds that they can escape from God. And that's going to be the concentration of our lesson this morning, that God has his way of righteousness, and there are those that believe that they can escape from that way of righteousness. In John 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There is no other way of righteousness than through Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 4, verse 12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Salvation is only found in Jesus' name. And as it is written in Acts 4, no other name. Jesus himself said in Matthew 7, 13 and 14, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Again, people think that they can find a way other than God's way. They believe that they can find salvation other than through Jesus Christ. But the Bible tells us that man must submit unto God in his way. In Romans chapter 10, beginning in verse 1, Paul said, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they be ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. I don't know of a clearer picture that's painted for us in all the Bible than the way that Paul portrays that it is man seeking his own righteousness versus God's righteousness. And so many times men choose their own way of righteousness rather than the righteousness of God. And the Apostle Paul made that declaration and that accusation against his own people, against the Jews. These people, addressed by the writer of Hebrews, it's stated that they believe that they can escape the way of salvation or the way of righteousness. Well, salvation is not found in the ways of men. In Proverbs 14, 12, Solomon wrote, There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. So man believes he can come up with his own way of salvation, and Solomon tells us that is not possible. Man cannot save himself, as Jeremiah tells us in Jeremiah 10, 23. Salvation is only found in Christ Jesus. You know, the Apostle Paul is writing primarily to those that are Christians in the book of Hebrews. And so the question really begs for us to answer is not only is this an information or a, a question that should be answered by everyone, but even by those that are Christians, how shall we escape if we neglect? Well, number one, let's look at this. Man cannot escape the all-seeing eye of God. He cannot escape the all-seeing eye of God. God sees and he knows all. How foolish it is for man to think that God will not see or will not hear or will not know what he does. In Proverbs 15 verse 3, the eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. Now I'm glad that God's paying attention when I do something good. We don't really want him to know about when we do something bad, but he does. We might think we can escape, but we cannot. In Hebrews 4, 13, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in sight, but all things are naked and open of the eyes of him with whom we have to do. In other words, God sees everything. The psalmist declared that he could not hide from God in Psalm 139. Men such as Achan had tried, but they failed. In Joshua chapter 7, he took that gold and silver and goodly Babylonish garment. He hid it under his tent. He hid it from everybody in the camp except God. God knew where it was. God was able to pinpoint exactly where those items were hidden to the destruction of Achan and his family. Men will so often do their evil deeds after dark, thinking that no one, no one will know or 
see. You know, we have cameras everywhere now, don't we? People even have them on the front door. How many times do we see a video of someone who comes and snatches a package or, or does some kind of harm on property, and, and it's captured by the owner with that camera? Well, that's one angle. That's at one time, and man sees that, but God sees it every time. God has every angle that's possibly known. He can see everything, and he knows everything. Robbers like to break into houses late at night because it reduces the risk of being caught because it's in darkness. But, you know, God can see through the dark. He knows. God can see the outward man, and he can see the inward man. In Jeremiah 23, 24, Jeremiah posed this question. Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, said the Lord? Do not I build heaven and earth, said the Lord? Isn't that interesting? Jeremiah long ago posing the question for God, and God said, where can you really hide that I can't see you? And man keeps trying to find places to hide, and God always sees. In Acts 1.24, when the apostles were ready to choose another to take Judas' place, they said and prayed, Lord, thou which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen. Notice the key there. God knows the hearts of every man. What does that mean? Well, he not only sees the outward man, but he can see the inward man. He knows what we're made of. In 1 Samuel 16, verse 7, we read about an occasion in which God's prophet is going to choose a king. God, of course, chose a king, but the prophet's going to declare who that king will be. And the Lord said to Samuel, look not on his countenance, nor on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. You know, this is an amazing thing to me, that so often... Our elections amount to a beauty contest. Some people vote on the appearance of the person. Not what they stand for, not what they represent, not how they vote, but how they look. That was very clear back in 1960. Now, some of you aren't old enough to remember 1960. I'm barely able to remember 1960, but I watched all the news about it and all the the presidential debate between John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon, and all they could talk about was how bad Nixon's makeup was and how good John F. Kennedy looked. And for some people, that was enough, and they passed it over John F. Kennedy. That's how that worked. And it still works that way many times today. But notice that it's not going to be the outward appearance of the man. What did Israel want? Well, Israel wanted a king to be like all the nations round about him. Boy, they wanted a great physical you know what God gave them for their first king? He gave them a great physical specimen because the Bible says that Saul, first king of Israel, was head and shoulders above all the men of Israel. In other words, he stood out. He was a great physical specimen. And he was disobedient to God. So when it came time for king number two, and the people had said uh, that they desired a king, that the Bible tells us that God chose a king that was not goodly necessarily to look upon. That was not going to be his criteria. Instead, in Acts 13, 14, and when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, who shall fulfill all my will. That's what was important to God. Not a great physical specimen, but someone who was after his own heart who would fulfill his will. They'd already gone round and round and round with King Saul, disobeying God left and right. And God said, this, now we're going to have a king that will obey my will. You know, the story is sometimes told about the foreman who was heading up a working crew. And this working crew would always lean on their shovel and sit down whenever the foreman left. But as long as he was there watching them, then they would work hard. One day, the foreman decided that he would take a break, and he left his glass eye sitting on a stump. And all the men kept working because they thought that he was still watching them. You know, God's eye is already watching us. It watches the outer man, it watches the inward man. And God chose David because he was a man after his own heart. He looked upon the heart of a person. And people need to realize, man needs to realize that as the Bible teaches, God is us. I don't know if this song is in our hymn book here, but there is one that says there's an all-seen eye watching you. Man 
consequences of sin. Man wants to live like a devil and he wants to die like a saint. That's what some people say. But the Lord issues a warning against such behavior. In Galatians 6, 7, and 8, Paul said, be not deceived. Now that's a question or that's a statement that's written to Christians because the book of Galatians is written to Christians, to saints, to brethren in the province of Galatia. So it covered a number of cities. And he says in that passage, be not deceived, God is not mocked. So often people are deceived into thinking that God can be mocked. In other words, God doesn't mean what he says and says what he means. And, and people deceive themselves into thinking that way. And here's what Paul said. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. That is an eternal principle. And it's a principle established by God, and God is not mocked. He's not lying about it. He's not being funny about it. He's being serious about it. And if man thinks it's not serious, he deceives himself. That's what Paul tells us in that verse. In, in Hosea 8, 7, the prophet said it this way. For they have sown the wind, and they shall reap the whirlwind. Now, sometimes people can escape a penalty of sin for a while. But not by living like the devil. You know, Jesus paid the price for our sins. The Bible says in 1 Peter 2, 24, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live under righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. We can receive the forgiveness of sins if we obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, when the people were pricked in their hearts and said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter and the other apostles said, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. Well, what happened? Their sins were washed away. God forgave them. That's what God said he would do. That's what God did do. And so therefore they were forgiven of their sins. In Colossians 1, 14, Paul said, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Our sins can be forgiven. Obedience is the only true escape from the law of sin and death. In Hebrews 5, 8 and 9, though we were a son, yet learned the obedience by the things which he suffered and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation and of all them that obeyed him. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We can escape the penalty of sin, but we still may not be able to escape the consequences of sin. The man who destroys his body, his family, his life with alcohol can be forgiven of the sin, but he may still have consequences for what he's done. A man with a gambling problem may squander away all of his money. He might be forgiven of the sin of gambling, but he's going to face the financial consequences that come along with that. A man who commits adultery, he may lose his wife because of the adultery. He can be forgiven of the adultery, but it doesn't mean he will not suffer consequences as a result of that. In Matthew 19, 9, and I say to you that whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, shall marry another, commit adultery, and whoso married her that is put away shall commit adultery. See, the Bible says if we sow, we will reap what we have sown. Parents who contend that their children are just having a little fun or sowing some wild oats need to heed the warning of God. There are consequences to sin. There is forgiveness of sin, and there are also consequences to sin. Sometimes people think they can escape those consequences, but they cannot. We try very hard to teach our children, to teach others personal responsibilities. Make the good decisions now. Make the good decisions now so that you don't have to bear the consequences of bad decisions for years to come. Now, I'm not talking about having children out of wedlock completely. That's part of it. I'm talking about a lot of decisions that young people make with drugs and alcohol, and it, it absorbs and overwhelms their life for years to come because of bad decisions made early. That's why Solomon said, remember now that creator that days of thy youth. While the evil days come not, when the years grow not, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. It is wisdom to not participate in certain things lest we have the rewards of those consequences for the rest of our lives. There are some things that are very difficult to reverse. Number three, man cannot escape death. Now, let me qualify this point by saying one thing. I'm not against people trying to improve their health. I think we could do a lot of things that would help improve our health. We can watch what we eat. We can watch our diets. We can take care of our sugar intake. There are just so many things that we can do, the exercise that we ought to do. You know, when you get old,
we still cannot escape death. No matter how well we take care of ourselves or how we let each other go, we still are going to face death. That is an appointment that God seldom will keep. The only way we will not keep that is if the Lord returns first. Otherwise, we all face death. Death is the final stage of life. And perhaps all of us at one time or another had an appointment that we had maybe with a doctor or a dentist. We try not to break those, but sometimes things come up and we call and we have to break the appointment. Sometimes they break the appointment with us. And even though it's important to us, that sometimes they get broken. But this is an appointment that will never be broken. We will all face death. It's appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. Hebrews 9, 27. In Joshua 23, 14. And behold, this day I am going the way of all the earth, and you shall know all in your hearts and all in your souls, that not one thing hath failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spake concerning you. All are come to pass of you, and not one thing hath failed thereof. These are Joshua's parting words to the children of Israel, telling them that God has fulfilled every promise, including the land promise, to the Israelites. Nothing failed. However, the first part of the verse says, I am going away of all the earth. In other words, I am about to die, just like everyone else. 1 Corinthians 15, 22, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. You see, when Adam and Eve ate of that forbidden fruit and the tree of life was taken away from them and taken away from all of us, physical death passed upon man. That is a consequence of the sin of Adam and Eve that was passed on to all of us. The sin wasn't passed to us, but the consequence of that sin is passed to us. Now we all die. That's a promise given to us. The Bible also teaches us that life is short. For those of us that are really getting older now, we know how short it is, do we not? We know how short it is. These weekends, I know weekends have always flown by, but now what's flying by is the week. The week is flying by, and then all of a sudden it's the weekend. It's Monday, and the next thing I turn out, it's Friday again. And then the weekend just flashes through, and then it all starts all over. It gets faster and faster. And James said, whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, and then vanish it away. You know, steam just does not stay in a room very long, does it? You put a kettle of water on the stove and you heat it up or some tea or something, and you see the vapor coming out, the steam coming out of that spout, and you take that off and it's, it dissipates, it's gone. No more steam. It just happens. I can snap my fingers. My writers won't let me snap my fingers. If I can snap my fingers, it disappears just like that. And James said, that's what life is like. Job said, man that is born of a woman is of a few days and full of trouble. He that cometh like a flower is cut down, and he pleaseth also as a shadow, and continueth not. A shadow. So fast. A fleeting time. There are those who are at the brink of death who beg for just a little more time. The cemeteries are full of people that testify to the fact of death. And that we cannot escape death. There are only two people. We read about Enoch. And we read about Elijah. Who God took. Everyone else has died. Even our Lord. He died. He rose again. But he died. And so we will all die. Unless the Lord comes for us. Man cannot escape. Number four. Man cannot escape the eternal judgment of God. God has appointed a day. In Acts 17, 30 and 31, the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commanded all men everywhere to repent. Why? Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. Now the Bible teaches that all of us will appear before God. In 2 Corinthians 5, 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bought back. Who will report before him? Who will appear before him? Everyone. The word all means all. Who does that mean now? All. Doesn't leave anyone out, right? If I said, everyone here, all of you, go and get ten dollars. Who would that leave out? That would leave out anyone. And if I say, all of you are going to face death, who does that leave out? That leaves out no one. All of you are going to face judgment. Who does that leave out? That doesn't leave out anyone. All will appear before God. 
beginning in verse 12, because Revelation 20 provides for us a very sobering thought. Revelation 20, beginning in verse 12, and I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out those things which are written in the book, according to their works. Now, we read earlier that all of them here and here, he says, the dead, small and great. Well, when you add the small and you add the great together, you've got everyone. And it doesn't matter who's measuring who's small and great. It doesn't matter who's making that evaluation. Small and great. That means everybody will stand before God. And so that's what we read here. That we will stand before God and the books will be open. We will be judged out of the things written in those books. If, if a person lived under the law of Moses, he's going to be, he's going to be judged by that book. If he lives under the patriarchal, patriarchal law, he'll be judged by that book. If he lives under the Christian dispensation, he'll be judged by the things written in the New Testament. What's written in the Bible will be judged. Sense that if I'm going to be judged out of those things in those books, I better know those books. Our world is so upside down because men are trying to decide right and wrong based on all different standards. You know, there are a lot of people that worship government today. That's their God, that's their religion. That's how they determine right and wrong. Not because of what the Bible said, but because of what their political party said. I'm, I'm going to follow this, I'm going to follow that, because of what my political leaders say. That's going to be right, that's going to be wrong. You, you have political leaders that are at odds with their religion. They claim to believe certain religions, and they do not even follow their religions because their politics differs with their religion, and so they are bound to be out of harmony with that. But even their religion is not enough. That's all the Bible. Your, your religion might be wrong. It might not be following the Bible. So what does the Bible say is right and wrong? What does God say is right and wrong? That's what we're going to be judged by. What God said, not what we think of one another. When right and wrong comes down to what I think it is, what you think it is, there is no right and wrong. That's when you fall into the argument of might makes right. As long as I've got enough strength, or as long as I've got enough people, or as long as I've got enough votes, or as long as I've got enough on my side, then we'll determine what's right. That's not the way it works. God determines what's right. Why? Because God's going to be the judge. God's going to judge, and he's going to judge out these books. And then what? Look at what God did for us. He then made the books available to us. He made the books available to us. In other words, I can read and study and get my life in harmony with the books that God's going to judge me out of because by His inspiration and by His providence, He has made those books available to me. What that means also is that I have no excuse. Since the books are made available to me, I have no excuse for my life to be out of harmony on the day of judgment. Because he gave us the book. That would be like the teacher saying, you're going to have a test over the contents of this book. And he hands us the book. And we come to the final test and we flunk it because we never opened and read the book. Well, I would say we have no one to blame but ourselves if we never opened and read the book. And if we're going to be judged out of harmony with God's will, he gave us the book and we never opened it and read it and lived by it. And we have no one to blame but ourselves. God says, you're going to be judged. Verse 13, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell were delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. Let me tell you something. We're going to be judged by our works according to God, not according to one another, according to ourselves. Some people think they do a lot of great things for God, but God doesn't even know them. Matthew 7, 21 through 23 tells us that. Lord, Lord, have I not prophesied in thy name, and thy name cast out devils, in thy name done many wonderful works? They will not profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work in it, but you are. I, I, I did all kinds of great things. But you're not a Christian. You're not a Christian. You might try to be good, but you're not a Christian. You're not living according to what the Bible says. You are not right in God's sight. Therefore, God's going to judge us in that way. Try to judge their own works, but it says God will judge the works. Verse 14, death and hell were cast in the lake of fire, which is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You realize this verse talks more about hell than it does heaven. There are going to be more people lost than will be saved. Man thinks he can escape. We will be judged by this 
that rejected me and received not my words hath one that judged them. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last days. What? That word that Christ gave us, we will be judged by that. We'll be judged on how we live in accordance with that word that we should be reading and studying. For example, our speech in Matthew 12, 36 and 37, I say to you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. People use profanity all the time. They use their tongues to lie to deceive, to cheat. They use it for slang, for pro not just profane, but words spoken in vanity, like using God's name in vain. And Jesus said, you'll be judged by those words you've spoken. Oh, well, Lord, I, I just got to have the saying that we'll get out of that. Get out of that. Make a conscious effort to get out of the habit of saying and using certain words. And especially using the Lord's name in vain. But people do it all the time. We hear it all the time. We even have little acronyms on texting. O-M-G. We want to put that in on the text. Using his name in vain. It can't even go smart to use his name in vain. Use an acronym. Our actions. When we judge our actions and Romans 14, 12, so that every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Galatians 6, 5 says, every man shall bear his own burdens. And 1 Peter 4, 5, we shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. God will judge. He'll judge our actions, what it is that we do. Not only what we say, but what we do. Now, here's the scary part. Our thoughts and our secrets in Ecclesiastes 12, 14. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or evil. Now remember, in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says, when you do your wrongs, you, you do that privately. You do that quiet. Don't go about bragging about how much you get. Just give. And here, God tells us he knows what we gave. Every good thing we did in secret and private, God knows. He says, when you pray, you can go to your closet and pray. You don't have to stand on the street corner and pray and say, oh, listen to me, pray. God said, don't do it that way. Go in your closet and pray. So when I pray to God in the privacy of my own room, he says, this secret thing, God hears. God knows about that. Well, I'm glad he knows about all those secret things that are good. But he also knows all the secret things that are bad. All the things we keep from others, and sometimes we even keep from ourselves. And God already knows about them. Think that we can escape that. Don't think that that can we brush it under the rug. Don't think that God's brushing it under the rug. It's not how that works. Finally, man cannot escape the eternal verdict of God. Now, I'm making a little distinction between the eternal judgment of God and the eternal verdict of God. In other words, the verdict will not be overturned. We live in a country of appeals. Men appeal all the time. They get convicted of some crime and they have the right to appeal. Maybe something was handled incorrectly. Maybe the lawyer didn't do what the lawyer's supposed to do, do. Maybe the judge allowed in some evidence or did not allow some evidence in that should have been. And as a result, the, 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 the uh, judgment wasn't rendered properly. And so he can appeal. And if it's found to have a basis, uh, then he might get a retrial. Or he might have the verdict thrown out altogether. But we can appeal. But understand that's... That's men making judgments about other men. But when God makes the verdict, it's done. There is no appeal process. Our lives are the appeal process. The time for an appeal is now. And be forgiven of our sins while we have time and opportunity to do so. In Matthew 25, 34, Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, and inherit the kingdom prepared for you, from the foundation of the world. Then shall he say unto them on his left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed in an everlasting fire, or everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angel. There are only two verdicts, righteous and wickedness. And there's no court of appeal. Remember in Luke chapter 16 when you have the rich man and Lazarus? And remember there was a great gulf fixed between the two? The rich man could not go to where Lazarus was, and Lazarus could not come over to where the rich man was. You know why? Because the verdict was final. 
There was nothing the rich man could say that would change God's mind about his situation. And there was nothing that could be said about Lazarus that would, be, that would change his situation. God made the verdict, and it's true, and it's right, and there's no appeal. Well, Lord, how about sending Lazarus back to talk to my five brothers? They're doing what I'm doing. They're going to be lost, too. And God said, they have Moses and the prophets. They listen to them. I'm not going to send Lazarus back. They won't believe him if he's raised from the dead. And look at all the people. Look how that came true. All the people that did not believe Jesus today, and he was raised from the dead. We cannot escape that burden. We cannot escape the consequence. God does not make mistakes. In Genesis 18, 25, that be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee, shall not judge, shall not the judge of all the earth do right. God does right. Sometimes people have questions. Trying to deal with the loss of loved ones, and they're, they're trying to determine. I had a, had a young father one time, had a 12 year old son who had killed an automobile accident. He was, he was very concerned because he knew that his son was right at that age where he could have possibly obeyed the gospel. And he was concerned about him. And I can understand that concern. Because when you have a son, especially one that may be more mature, did he understand, did he not understand? What did he exactly understand? Should he obey the gospel? He wasn't a Christian yet, but he was 12 years old. And the only words I could come up with was, the Lord will always do what's right. The Lord will always do what's right. Nothing else can be done about that boy. That father could not do anything about that boy. The mother perished in the same car accident. Nothing can be done about that 12-year-old boy. But you know what could be done? With the brother that was left behind. Something can still be done about him. But God will always do what's right. Sometimes people get caught up in all the what is, what if this, what if that. God will always do what's right. Make sure that you are right with God yourself. Make sure that when we stand before God, we are right with God when we do so. The only way to make sure that we're Christian is every day repent of our sins and ask God for forgiveness so that we can have all of those sins forgiven. We start a new day, a new day of decisions, and hopefully the next day we'll make better decisions than the prior day. One decision at a time. What did, what did Paul say in Hebrews chapter 2? How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Well, we cannot escape the all-seen eye of God. We cannot escape the consequence of sin. We cannot escape death. We cannot escape the eternal judgment of God. And we cannot escape the eternal verdict of God. But what we can do we can obey the gospel of Jesus Christ right now. By coming unto him through faith, repenting of sins, confessing in Jesus' name, being immersed in water for the remission of sins, and God said, I will forgive those sins. And then he adds us to his church, and then we have the privilege of prayer and repentance and confession of that sin and the prayer for those sins, and we can be forgiven every day of the sins that we have committed, starting all over every day.